So our next, next uh, speaker is Cindy Ovington. She's actually uh, completing her PhD in neuroscience at McGill University under my uh, supervision. And she will be presenting uh, today on the topic of uh, persistent negative symptoms and their brain imaging and cognitive uh, correlates. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, good afternoon. Negative symptoms are an important aspect of psychotic disorders and contribute greatly to poor prognosis. Our lab has focused its research on these symptoms, and today I'd like to share some of these results with you. Broadly uh, speaking, negative symptoms are defined by five domains, including the loss of pleasure, uh, decreased social drive, lack of motivation, emotional unresponsiveness, and impoverished speech. So as you can see, in contrast to positive symptoms, which are an excess of normal behavior, negative symptoms are a reduction of normal behavior. This figure helps illustrate the expression of positive and negative symptoms over time. Uh, the negative symptoms are represented by the red line, and positive symptoms are represented by the blue line. Everything to the, le to the left of this black line is considered the prodrome. And as you can see here, the negative symptoms seem to appear before the onset of positive symptoms. At some point, you get the acute psychotic episode and you get a huge increase of positive symptoms, as well as negative symptoms, but these are masked by the increase of positive symptoms. With treatment, negative symptoms and positive symptoms decrease. But as you can see here in between the two black lines, Positive symptoms will decrease much more during remission than negative symptoms. And you have here higher levels of negative symptoms. These are the symptoms that we are interested in, and we refer to them as persistent negative symptoms. Why is it important for us to study these symptoms? Well, first, they've been shown to contribute to poor functional and poor clinical outcome. They've been shown to um, be related to elevated levels of treatment discontinuation, and many studies have shown that elevated levels of negative symptoms correlate with cognitive deficits. Another reason why it's important to study these symptoms, but in a first episode um, psychosis population, is because we want to avoid the confounds due to illness chronicity, such as antipsychotic medications, which you heard of in the previous talk, um, sedentary lifestyle, and institutionalization. If we could identify these symptoms earlier on, we could perhaps provide more appropriate treatment or more effective treatment um, since it's early on in the illness. Our um, lab focused had um, several objectives in terms of persistent negative symptoms. First, we wanted to define this subgroup of negative symptoms. What are persistent negative symptoms? How do they contribute to, poor, to, to functional outcome in first episode? What are the associations between persistent negative symptoms and cognition? And what are the neural correlates of persistent negative symptoms? There are many studies in chronic or enduring schizophrenia, but what's of interest here is in the first episode in psychosis, what is going on during this time? To define persistent negative symptoms, um, right now um, in the literature with um, Dr. Mala and Buchanan in 2007, we have defined negative symptoms as including both primary and secondary negative symptoms. However, there's still, this is still a matter of debate. Um, primary negative symptoms are intrinsic to the illness, whereas secondary negative symptoms um, could be as a result of um, depressive or positive symptoms. To identify persistent negative symptoms, we can use any validated negative symptom scale, such as the SANS or the PANS. The estimated prevalence um, in first episode for persistent negative symptoms is between 15 and 40 percent. The reason why there is a huge variability in this percentage be is because many um, studies have applied different definitions, so we've ended up with a large percentage for its prevalence. Therefore, our first study focused on comparing different definitions in the literature, and what you see here is what we came up with as being perhaps um, a, a good definition for persistent negative symptoms. And it was defined as the following, having minimum, uh, minimal positive symptoms, minimal depressive and extra pyramidal symptoms. They had to have at least moderate severity of negative symptoms. What do I mean by this? Well, they had to have a score of three or more on the SANS uh, on a minimum of one global item of the SANS. So the SANS um, 
we are looking at four of the global items of the sense. We exclude one of them. This severity had to be, oops, excuse me. This severity had to be present at month three, which we considered to be our initial baseline. And then in addition to that, they needed to maintain this severity of negative symptoms for a minimum of six consecutive months. When we applied this definition to a group of 158 first episode um, psychosis patients, we found a prevalence rate of 27%. The patients who had persistent negative symptoms were shown to have poor functional outcome uh, at month 12 compared to patients who did not have persistent negative symptoms. We were then interested in looking at the individual items of the signs, which we see here on the right. And we found that in the group of patients who met the criteria for persistent negative symptoms, they seem to have elevated levels of abolition apathy and anhedonia asociality. Our next objective aimed at looking at the um, relationship between cognition and these symptoms. Right now, we've seen um, in the literature that if patients who have elevated levels of negative symptoms seem to have poor neurocognitive functioning or performance. However, more specifically, some of these items that we saw in the signs, so one of the, these four items, um, have correlated specifically with um, cognitive deficits such as abolition and verbal memory impairments, alogia, and poor working memory or verbal fluency. Therefore, we wanted to look at this um, in a first episode group. And longitudinally, most studies have shown that there is a relative stability of cognition over time. However, some studies have also said, uh, have also um, proposed that negative symptoms, when they improve, this is paralleled with improvement of cognition. Therefore, we wanted to investigate memory ability in first episode patients with persistent negative symptoms and assess this trajectory um, over time, over a 12-month period. We looked at, we studied three different memory domains, including visual, verbal, and working. And at the initial assessment, we compared three groups. Um, patients with persistent negative symptoms, those who did not meet the criteria for persistent negative symptoms, and healthy controls. For the change over time, we only looked at these subjects with persistent and those without. Here we have a graph uh, with the z-scores on the y-axis and the three memory domains. We found that only in the verbal memory domain was there a difference between those with persistent negative symptoms and those without. Uh, and for the other two domains, there was no difference between um, the two patient groups. When we looked at this relationship over time, there was no change over time. Therefore, these symptoms, um, sorry, the, this memory ability or, or impairment is stable over time. Once again, we looked at the individual items of the signs and found greater levels of alogia in, um, in the PNS group uh, that correlated with poor verbal memory. Our next objective focused at the neural correlates of persistent negative symptoms. Many studies have shown, again, in enduring schizophrenia, that there are correlations with gray matter volume decreases and increased negative symptoms. In one of our recent studies in our group, we found that when using, when applying voxel-based morphometry in, again, first episode psychosis um, with patients who have persistent negative symptoms, we found reduced gray matter volume in two areas. The first two lines, um, the first two rows represent the right medial frontal gyrus, where we found gray matter volume decreases, and the bottom two lines represent are, are the right parahippocampal gyrus. White matter integrity has also been studied and have, has been found to, uh, sorry, decreased uh, white matter integrity has been found to be correlated with increased negative symptoms as well. Fractional anisotropy is a measure that we can use to assess white matter integrity. And a recent study found that in schizophrenia patients who have primary and enduring negative symptoms, which is referred to as deficit syndrome, had decreased um, fractional anisotropy in three main areas the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, the incident fasciculus, and the arcuate fasciculus. Um, sorry, therefore, our next objective was to investigate white matter integrity in first episode patients with PNS. We used a region of interest approach and focused on five main areas. The cingulum, which is seen here in green, the fornix, here in yellow, 
the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which is in yellow, the uncinate fasciculus here in fuchsia, and the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus. We measured um, fractional anisotropy values in these five areas and compared them between three groups, those with persistent, neg with persistent negative symptoms, those without, and healthy controls. We found reduced FA values in our persistent negative symptom group in the fornix and the incident fasciculus on, in the right hemisphere. And this was in comparison to controls. And our preliminary findings also found the, that both patient groups had lower FA values in the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, again in the right hemisphere. What do our preliminary findings mean? Well, these two areas that we found with decreased um, white uh, FA was the incinet fasciculus, which connects the orbital frontal cortex with the temporal lobe. And as we've heard now in a few presentations, the orbital frontal cortex seems to be involved in first episode and might be more specific to negative symptoms. In addition, this white matter track is critical um, for emotion and memory. Interestingly, uh, a study showed that lower FA values in this particular white matter track correlates with negative symptom severity and verbal memory. So if you recall from the cognition study, we also found re decreased verbal memories being specific to persistent negative symptoms. Lastly, the fornix um, connects the hippocampal formation to the prefrontal cortex. Again, two key areas that have been highlighted um, in negative symptoms. Therefore, our studies helped shed some light on persistent negative symptoms and showed that the prevalence rate is about 27%. These individuals present with poor functional outcome, poor verbal memory, reduced gray matter um, volume, as well as reduced white matter integrity. But we haven't answered, there still are a lot of questions that remain to be answered. If we were to treat effectively persistent negative symptoms with this correlate, with this um, result in improved verbal memory, or if we had cognitive remediation specific to verbal memory, would this help improve persistent negative symptoms? And then also with regards to the neural correlates, is, are these specific deficits present earlier on in the illness? Um, I'd like to thank everybody who was involved in this research, and thank you all for listening. So thank you very much, uh, Cindy. So we, we have time, perhaps, for uh, one question from the audience. Uh, yes, you can go to the microphone, maybe. It's all very scientific. So um, uh, I have a question. Uh, you, you talked about um, reduction in gray matter. And um, the other doctor talked about that also, who was up here before Michael Bodner. I forget his name, Stefan, I think it was. But yes. Anyway, okay. Um, my question is, uh, once the volume of gray matter decreases, uh, can it ever increase again? And if it can't, does this matter for recovery? It's a very, it's a very good question. Um, I think, I, I don't know... You could, okay, so for example, for cognition. So I mentioned cognitive remediation. So if, in terms of gray matter, if you have poor verbal memory, you can go through cognitive remediation and try to increase that performance. So in that term, if lower gray matter is associated with verbal memory, we can try to improve it that way. So there is um, pr pruning or there are, you are uh, through plasticity increasing, yes, exactly. Um, but I don't know to what extent that could be fixed. Uh, yeah, and just to, to add to that, I think, yeah, I think plasticity is really the key word here, that the, this is one of the great quality of the brain, to, be, uh, to have this uh, plasticity. And, and there is indeed evidence for, for increase, that through training or physical activity, there can be some increase in the gray matter volume. So thank you very, very much. Again.